Section 25 of A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 3, by Henry Charles Lee. Book 7, Chapter 4, Part 2. According to inquisitorial jurisprudence, there were several causes which entailed relaxation. The first of these was pertinacity, the obstinacy which led the heretic or apostate to avow and defend his errors, and to resist the well-meant effort of his judges to save his soul by inducing conversion. This heroic temper, which preferred martyrdom to denying what it believed to be the truth, was not common, but the annals of the Inquisition are illustrated by cases of unknown and forgotten victims, whose persistence through torment and persuasion, to the fiery death at the Brasero, ennobles human nature, whether they are Moslems or Jews, Protestants or mystics. It was a blind perversity that refused to see in this aught but hardness of heart, inspired by Satan, and with empty rhetoric sought to draw a distinction between this and true martyrdom. Thus Simancas tells us that we should not be surprised to see heretics sometimes carried rejoicing to the stake. This is not true alacrity, but madness, not patience, but fierceness, and there is wide difference between barbarous fierceness and the modest constancy of the true martyr. Then there are those who, by certain arts, so benumb the body that it does not feel torments. There are also those who deprive the mind of sense, so that they meet death without fear, but that gentleness and placidity, that sublime humility and humble sublimity, we see only in the martyrs of Christ. Yet, to do it justice, the Inquisition, at least after the first fury of its career was spent, earnestly sought the salvation of its victims, rather than to send them through temporal to eternal flame. We have seen that, in the case of those sentenced to relaxation, it advanced the notification of their fate, in order to enlarge the opportunity of the ghostly counsellors, whom it deputed to labour with them. Even before this extension, the instructions of 1561 order inquisitors to do everything in their power to induce conversion, so that, if nothing else can be accomplished, the culprit may not die without the knowledge of God. During the fortnight previous to an auto de fe, those sentenced to relaxation were to be summoned to repeated audiences, where they were to be earnestly entreated to confess and recant, with promises of mercy, and learned theologians were required to be present to aid in the exhortations. Even prior to the consulta de fe, pious inquisitors spared no effort to convince the erring of their errors. One relates how, in 1630, he had to deal with two Protestants, an English and a Frenchman, who were pertinacious, saying that they had been brought up in their pretended reformed religion and knew nothing of Catholicism. Their simplicity went so far as to ask to be allowed to return to their native lands, or that persons learned in both religions should dispute before them, so that they might learn which was best, for, as they were illiterate, they could not themselves dispute. The inquisitors set theologians to work upon them, when, after considerable labor, they were converted. Devotional books were given to them, which they eagerly devoured. The trial was delayed, and, by the time the witnesses were ratified, the heretics were good Catholics. When three days' notice of impending relaxation was given, the time was utilized to the utmost. There was a pertinacious heretic to suffer in the Seville auto of December 10, 1719, a Moorish slave, baptized under the name of Francisco Andres, who had renegated and was persistent when his sentence was made known to him. Then twelve calificadores, to each from the orders of mercenarians, minims, Franciscans, Dominions, Augustinians, and Jesuits, with eight familiars, were assigned to his conversion. They were successful, and he escaped with prison and San Benito for four years. A remarkable case at the Seville Auto of July 5, 1722, shows, however, that, 
after delivery to the secular arm, the Inquisition considered that its functions were ended. There were four pertinacious Jews, two men and two women. Nine calificadores and eleven familiars labored with them in vain during the three days. They persisted through the reading of the sentences, and were delivered to the secular magistrate. The two men and the elder of the women succumbed at the last, professed conversion, and were garroted and burned. The younger woman, known as La Almiranta, at the Brasero begged audience of the deputy assistente, told him that she desired to confess and give evidence as to other Jews, and was remanded to the royal prison. Word was sent to the tribunal, which replied that it had nothing further to do with her. She was kept until the seventh, and, when taken to the Brasero, was more pertinacious than ever, saying that, as her companions had died as Catholics, they were accursed, and that she had pretended to yield in order that her ashes, which were holy, should not be mingled with theirs. Of course she had the martyrdom which she craved. In exceptional cases, pertinacity seems to have been allowed the privilege of preliminary strangulation. At a Valladolid auto of May 29, 1691, there were five pertinacious women condemned for Judaism, described as being from twenty-four to twenty-seven years of age, and very handsome, who excited general compassion. On being delivered to the magistrate, two of them weakened, while three persisted in their faith, yet they were all garroted before burning. A large portion of the cases of pertinacity arose from the death in prison, during trial, of those who did not ask on the deathbed for the consolations of religion, and who had no opportunity of obtaining mercy by conversion. Thus in the Granada Auto of May 13, 1725, out of seven burnings in effigy, six were of those who had died in prison. Suicide in prison was treated harshly, for Simancas tells us that the suicide is to be condemned as fully convicted and impenitent, even though he had previously confessed and professed repentance, to which Rojas adds that, although his effigy is to be burnt, his heirs are allowed to prove insanity, difficult as that is. The negativo, the man who denied his heresy in the face of what was deemed competent testimony of guilt, was classed as an impenitent heretic and doomed to relaxation. This was the inevitable logic of the Inquisition, although it led to the most tragic of all situations, that of being tortured to death in honor of the faith which the sufferer held. It was impossible, under the inquisitorial system, to allow a possible heretic to escape merely because he unflinchingly affirmed his orthodoxy, and yet, when a man asserted it up to the bracero, knowing that it would not avail him, it was impossible not to recognize him a true believer who would not save his body at the expense of falsely confessing apostasy. Three such were in the Granada Auto of May 27, 1593, burned as negativos, and consequently burned alive. Such men were true martyrs, especially as rigid constructionists denied them the consolations of religion in their last moments. At the Toledo Auto of October 28, 1723, Diego de Quiros was in this position, and a Jesuit who heard him in sacramental confession was severely censured for doing so while he persisted in maintaining his innocence. Again the question came up in the Toledo Auto of July 1, 1725. Fernando de Castro was relaxed as an impenitent negativo, and was sentenced to burning alive. On account of the heat, the execution was postponed until the afternoon, and the convict was meanwhile placed in the public prison. With cries he earnestly begged for sacramental confession, but the frailes in attendance declined unless he should admit his heresy, which he steadfastly refused to do, asserting the witnesses to be perjured and the judgment unjust. At this juncture there came a Jesuit father who yielded to the despairing appeals of the poor wretch and heard him in confession, whereupon the judge took the responsibility of modifying the sentence to preliminary strangulation. The frailes loudly rebuked the Jesuit, 
and were joined by the public, disappointed of the promised spectacle of the burning alive of a fellow creature. Considerable debate followed, and a priest named Candido Munoz wrote an argument justifying the Jesuit, but his labor was superfluous, for, while his tract was in the press, the Suprema issued a carta acordada, October 11th, ordering that in such cases the priest should hear the confession and confer absolution or not, according to the disposition manifested, but in future no one but the appointed theologians were to attend the convict to the last. Thus it was left to this late date to admit the dying victim to the sacraments, probably, we may assume, on the doctrine that the blood of martyrdom is the most efficacious of all sacraments. Such cases could not have been common, but those must have been numerous in which the unjustly convicted negativo found his resolution give way at the approach to the brasero, and, in order to escape burning alive and to obtain the sacraments, falsely confessed to having entertained heresies which his soul abhorred. There was also the diminuto, who made a confession that did not satisfy the evidence, and thus was held to be imperfect. A confession that was not full was regarded as fictitious. It inferred impenitence, and therefore entailed relaxation. We have seen how, under the early edicts of grace, any omissions in the hurried confessions was construed as rendering them imperfect, and subjecting the penitent to prosecution and relaxation. Especially was imperfect denunciation of accomplices regarded as diminutio. If the accused confessed all that was in evidence against himself, and omitted the acts of accomplices who were proved to have been with him, or if he named only those who were absent or dead or already convicted, it was proof of malice and impenitence he was not truly converted, and was subject to relaxation, after torture, in caput alienum. The denial of heretical intention in acts confessed, which was frequent in those against whom Judaic or Moorish customs were proved, constituted the accused a negativo in the substantial part of heresy, which is intention, or a diminuto, implying, according to the common opinion, impenitence and pertinacity involving relaxation. Thus Hernando de Palma, a Morisco, accused of teaching and conducting Moorish ceremonies, denied and overcame severe torture, whereupon the consulta de fe voted for appearance in an auto and abjuration de levi. Ignorant of this, he asked for an audience, and confessed that, for seven or eight years, he had practiced some Moorish rites, without regarding them as contrary to the faith. In this he persisted, and was burnt in the Toledo Auto of 1606. Revocation of confession was similarly impenitence and pertinacity, as in the case of Manuel Thomas, who confessed to Judaism after the accusation was presented, then revoked the confession, and persisted in the revocation, for which he was relaxed in the Toledo Auto of 1585. When the Reformation plunged the Church into a struggle for life, of which no man might foretell the result, there arose a demand for sharper measures of repression. The dogmatizer or heresiarch, he who not only condemned his own soul to perdition, but sought to carry others along with him, by disseminating his pestiferous doctrines, might recant and make his peace with God, but not with God's earthly ministers. Simancas well expresses the hatred intensified by fear, which was aroused by the teachers of the new doctrines. The heresiarch, he says, the master of errors, is to be relaxed, and under no circumstances is to be received back into the church. He is unworthy of pardon who has led others into error, like a murderer who has slain many. He is a crafty homicide who daily sheds the blood of souls, he who teaches heresy slays, not with the sword, but with the poison of his doctrine. He kills not the body, but the soul, not with temporary, but with eternal death. Wherefore, he is worthy of the severest punishment. And of all others, the teachers of the Lutheran heresies are in no way to be pardoned. 
yet the church had always professed to welcome to reconciliation its erring children who renounced their errors and begged for mercy provided they were not relapsed and the inquisition from its inception had acted on this principle on this were based the powers deputized to it and when in fifteen fifty eight the discovery of the protestants of valladolid was so exploited as to throw spain into agitation and it was desired to make an example of dr augustine casaya some further grant of faculties was felt to be necessary paul the fourth was nothing loath in fifteen fifty five he had apparently desired to show that rome was not to be outdone by geneva in persecuting rigor and that if calvin in fifteen fifty three had burnt servet for denying the trinity he could be equally zealous for the faith by the bull cum corundum he decreed that all who denied the trinity the divinity of christ his conception through the holy ghost his death for human salvation or the perpetual virginity of the virgin and who did not confess to inquisitors and abjure their errors within three months and all who in future should maintain those heresies should be treated as though they were relapsed and as such should be forthwith relaxed to the secular arm having thus extended the catalogue of unpardonable heresies he was quite ready to grant the additional powers sought by the spanish inquisition by a brief of january four fifteen fifty nine he bestowed on the inquisitor general and suprema a faculty to relax all heresiarchs and other heretics even though they were not relapsed and though they desired to abjure their heresies when it was believed with very similitude that the abjuration was not sincere but was only to escape punishment this was in fact no more than the power assumed in the instructions of fourteen eighty four but under it as we shall see hereafter were relaxed some conspicuous heretics such as dr casaya at valladolid and juan ponce de leon at seville although they had renounced their errors and sought reconciliation in advance of the autos de fe it thus became a principle in inquisitorial jurisprudence that the inquisitor general and suprema could relax dogmatizers irrespective of pertinacity or relapse this was not confined to protestants about sixteen hundred the suprema had to decide the case of a morisco alfaqui accused of being a teacher of islam who confessed to teaching his wife but denied other proselytism a consulta presented to the suprema argued that although by law a dogmatizer must be relaxed yet if he spontaneously denounces himself and is sincerely repentant he can be reconciled for his conversion and humility serve as an example to those whom he has misled in the present case however the alfaqui has only confessed partially and to save himself wherefore he should be relaxed and to this the suprema assented yet this severity had exceptions in the seville auto of july five seventeen twenty two pedro de alpuin reconciled with perpetual prison and san benito had five years of galleys added for being a teacher of the law of moses and even these were remitted in consideration of his infirmities end of section twenty five